Start looking for Zephaniah. If you find Matthew and go back a few pages, you'll get there quicker than if you thumb through the whole Old Testament. <laughs> Zephaniah is part of that thing they called the Book of the Twelve. They called it the Minor Prophets. I think last week when we got through with chapter one, you said there's nothing minor about this prophet. <clears throat> He was a heavyweight all the way, prophesied between the period of time when the northern kingdom of Samaria or Israel fell and was dispersed by the Assyrians. That had already happened, but just ahead, about 100 years ahead or less than 100 years ahead, was going to be the destruction of Jerusalem, the conquest of Judea and our Judah, and then the uh, Babylonian captivity where they'd be hauled off into Babylonian captivity. So he was giving them warnings. And in there, he talked about the upcoming judgment, but the most important judgment he spoke of was the last day judgment, the final day, the eschaton, the great day of the Lord, the day of God's wrath in his anger, and, uh, and gave fair warning and also some gospel. Today, we look at chapter two. There's three chapters in the, in the book, and we'll hopefully get through chapter two today, and then we'll take three next time and wrap it up. Uh, in our fourth uh, time together. But turn to chapter 2, and I'm going to read a few verses at a time, and then we can see what they are. I think I've sort of sensed how the blocking goes, the paragraphs, and uh, I, I'm always conscious of context. I want to read the next verse and the next verse, and, and when I get to some place. But let me read this for you. Zephaniah chapter 2. Gather together, yes, gather, O shameless nation, before the decree takes form effect before the day passes away like chaff before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord seek all you humble of the land who do his just commands seek righteousness seek humanity uh, humility perhaps you may be hidden in the day of the anger of the Lord well, this obviously follows the great prophecies of power and doom that he has prophesied upon them in chapter one. He moves into this phase and, and gives them something to do. The first thing he says here is to gather together. Yes, gather. Now, just taking the English translation there, there's nothing wrong with that. He calls for the great convocation of the assembly of Israel, something that was done since the days of Moses. The people would come together and there's a lot of important things that would happen. They would even have convocations together when they came back from Babylonian captivity. So the gathering together of God's people is, a, is not an unusual thing. In fact, the word synagogue means to gather together. That's what it means. And, uh, and God's people have been synagoguing together right on up to this current hour. But that's not what that means. The better translation is, instead of gather together, gather, it is stoop low. Stoop low. Bow down. It's the picture of someone who is humble and working in a field. It's the, it's the lower classes and the poor that would, that would glean in the fields and would pick up what was left of the grain that had fallen. It was, it was the sense of bowing down, being humble, being servile, and completely bowing down before the Lord. And this is, of course, exactly what the people need to do. They need to come low. They need to bow down. They need to gather the stubble. They need to be low before the Lord. And we'll see if we get to it, hopefully we will, a couple of cross-references that will reemphasize this idea of God's people uh, bowing down, stooping low. Notice he says to do this, there's an urgency. You need to get this done before something happens, before the judgment comes. The warnings are always about what we should do before the judgment comes. One of the prophets laments on one occasion that the harvest is past, the summer is done, and we're not saved. There is a time in which something is everlastingly too late. And bowing down before the Lord in humility and coming to Him is, is the, the foremost of those things. There is never but one day of salvation. Today is the day of salvation. 
Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Just don't miss that. And that goes for us sitting here this day, this hour. If we need to do business with God, if we need to come low and bow down before him and, and show him that we seek him. And so it is before the decree. And these are the decrees of God. Remember what the, remember what the opening decree is? I will utterly... I will utterly sweep away everything from the face of the earth, declares the Lord. That's the decree. And we need to come to God before that happens. We've got some real sloppy eschatologists being taught in our churches today, almost like people have, have just will have an infinite number of chances to call upon the Lord and to be saved. That nobody's really going, there's never going to be really a, a final gun sound and it's all over. They're just full of second chances. And that's not at all what the scripture says. The scripture, scriptures always put upon us an urgency. And it says before the decree takes effect, literally before it gives birth, it's like when a baby is coming, the baby's coming. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's just, that's it. You know, you've been anticipating it. You've got approximate idea of when the baby's coming. You're not sure, but when you know the baby's coming, when the baby's coming, you can't stop it. You can't slow it down. You can't say, this is a bad day. Let's, let's put it off till Tuesday. And, and that's the way the coming of the Lord is. There's a lot of analogies in Scripture that are, that, are, that are like travail, a woman in travail, in childbirth. And a lot of the operations of God uh, have that picture. Before the day passes away like chaff. This is the, the continuation of that image of, of the grain. The great threshing floor was where they would bring all the grain. And then they had several ways of, of pounding the grain out. We talked about one of them in a message some time back, how that they, they would use the... Uh, uh, the big platform that the oxen would walk on and it would, it would create a, 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 a vibrating effect and it would pound the grain away from the stalk and away from the chaff. Uh, by the way, that, uh, that thing is a, it was called a, a tremble. It's the tremble, the tribulation is what that is. It's, it's a, it was a great machine. And then they would sometimes just have the oxen or the mules walk over it with, the, with their raw uh, uh, hoofs and pound it out. But whatever would happen, there'd be a huge amount of chaff down below. And then there would come just a little breeze. And when the breeze would come, that chaff would puff up into a big cloud. And it, it would really be irritating. But then it would be gone. And that picture of judgment being like chaff being separated was used by a lot of the prophets, including the last Old Testament prophet that lived. You remember John the Baptist? What did he say? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. He talked about the coming king. He said he has his winnowing fork in his hand. You know what a winnowing fork is? It's a big fork that would lift up the grain and would throw it up. And when it did, the heavy grain would fall, but the chaff would blow away. A winnowing away, a separating of the wheat from the chaff. And this is what the imagery and the picture is concerning the judgment of God. So we got two vivid images of the coming of the Lord, that of travail and childbirth and that of the winnowing and the chaff, the blowing away of the chaff. And there's a lot of imagery in scripture about the chaff, the worthlessness of it, how it's just basically dried and shriveled grass. And the prophet tells us all flesh is grass, but the word of the Lord abides forever. And so we, our lives are, can be just a, a summer mowing. And then once the harvest is complete, the chaff is just blown away. Talking about the insignificant, very significant images. That's not only before it takes effect, before there comes upon you the burning anger of the Lord, before there comes upon you the day of the anger of the Lord. And that's what we saw in chapter 1. So this sort of ties us into chapter one when we're talking about this, this great coming of the Lord. And we're called upon to bow down. It's urgent. And then uh, three times we've had three uses of the word before. We have three uses of the word anger and three uses of the word seek in this very paragraph. Seek the Lord, haul you humble of the land. All of those that have stooped low, the humble are to seek the Lord in humility, who do his just commands. This is a picture of the obedience that is required of the Lord. Seek righteousness, seek humility. Perhaps you may be hidden on the day of the anger of the Lord. 
This is not teaching works righteousness. By the way, it was misinterpreted that way by the traditions of the elders. And Jesus spent a good part of his public ministry trying to straighten out. We're seeing some of that in the Sermon on the Mount that we're looking at on Sunday mornings. Uh, Jesus spent a good bit of his time trying to show the people that those who obey, those that seek righteousness, those that do well are people who have already been justified, already been saved, already have the indwelling spirit of the Lord within them. We don't do works of righteousness. We do not perform obedience to the Lord in order to be rescued. We're rescued by the sovereign grace and mercy of the Lord. That's the word salvation means. The brute idea of it is it is to rescue. We are rescued from our, from our, from our uh, condemnation and our sin and our, our sentence of death by the Lord. Then we perform the acts of righteousness and obedience. We are enabled to do so by the indwelling spirit. And we are motivated to do so by a love for the Lord. And we are equipped and enabled to do it because we've been made alive in Christ. That doesn't change. That's the way it's, it, you know, a lot of people have a real disconnect between the Old Testament and the New. One of the things I try to do in my teaching is to, is to show that there just ain't that much difference between the two. There's a continuity that is strong as a, a rod of steel going between what God said and did in the Old Testament and what God says and does in the New Testament. And, and it's, it, it's the same God doing the same salvific work. What we have in the Testaments is we have the unfolding of God's dealing with us through various covenants and dispensations. But the way God acts, God is always saved by grace through faith. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Salvation by grace goes all the way back. And that's the only way. God brought his people out of Egypt by grace. We are saved by grace, the grace bestowed upon us in Christ. And so this, this idea of seeking righteousness and humility is, is given to us as a matter of our sanctification, not our justification. Okay, I better stop there on that. Let's get to the next paragraph. <clears throat> For Gaza shall be... And notice the names of these cities. Some of you will recognize these names from the book of Judges. In the book of 1 Samuel, for example, these are four of the five cities of the Philistines. And so he, he, he gives a, a, a prophecy concerning them. For Gaza shall be deserted, Ashkelon shall become a desolation, Ashdod's people shall be driven out at noon, and Ekron shall be uprooted. Uh, sounds like a little parallelism, doesn't it? The four, the four are named and they're each given kind of the same fate. That one's a desolation. One is that they, uh, it is driven out by noon. The word Gaza kind of means, if you add a little suformative to it, it kind of means deserted. Gaza will be deserted. Uh, Ashkelon shall become a desolation, a desolate place. Ashdod, a people shall be driven out at noon, which is interesting. In the ancient world, they didn't fight at high noon. Too hot. They would fight in the twilight. They would fight in the dawn of the hours. Occasionally they would fight at midnight if they wanted the element of surprise, but they didn't have night goggles back then, so the night vision wasn't so good. Most battles took place in the cool of an evening. And they worked real hard to get their battles to where they need to be, so there was an advantage. High noon was a place of surprise. At high noon, most of them were asleep. Some were even already a little drunk from their lunch. But God's judgment comes when you don't expect it. And that's, your, that's not only true of nations, that's true of our, our personal lives. The judgment of God will come upon us at times when we don't even realize and realize it's coming. We have to have an eye out for that. These cities here, does anybody, can anybody think of the one that's not mentioned? Remember I said there's five cities of the Philistines. You remember Samson? Samson, uh, God called him to kill Philistines. That was his job. That was his life calling. Go kill all the Philistines you can. <laughs> And he goofed around and messed around, and you know what he did. He spent his, all of his time chasing women and getting drunk and doing all sorts of stuff. And, but then they ended up putting out his eyes and putting him in prison. What did he do when he was in prison? He's grinding away at that old wheel. They used him like, a, like an ox or a donkey to pull the, 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 thresh, the wheel, the grinding wheel, the mill wheel. He didn't have any 
eyes, they'd been gouged out, but I guarantee you had tear ducts because he was crying. He was repenting. He was calling upon the Lord. He was getting right with God. He, he had been freed from all of his lust and all of his uh, profligate lifestyle. He was now a man that had been purged by God's forgiveness. And so now God says, now, let's do it. Your last day on earth, you're going to kill five lords of the Philistines and your great pavilion that you're going to pull down. You're going to destroy more people in this last hour of your life than you would have if you'd been killing Philistines all your life. By the way, for some of us, our last day will be our best day. Don't ever think God's through with you. He may have one more big task for you to do not long before you see Him in glory. We all are carrying within our bodies a death sentence. We just don't know when exactly it's going to be. And for some of us, it's closer than others. And we don't know who that is. But God will work with you and work in you and have you work for Him right up to the last day of your life. And this is what's going on now. Let me just sort of set up the chapter a little bit from this. The cities of the Philistines... And by the way, the, the origin of the Philistines is kind of vague in, in, in uh, ancient history. It's kind of hard to, to know where they come from. But because they settled kind of that, uh, that southwest coast of, of, of uh, the, uh, the land, they were, many thought they came from the, an island of the sea or came from somewhere across the Mediterranean. If that is true, they came in at a very early period of time, at least 15 uh, to maybe 2000 BC. They came in at a very early period of time. If they did come from that direction, and if they are of those peoples, they're probably descendants of Japheth. Remember the three sons of Noah? And why do I mention that? It's because the other guys that are mentioned are descended from Ham and, and, and Shem. And if so, you've got all three sons of Jacob, I mean, I mean of uh, Noah, involved in this prophecy which, by the way, makes up all of humanity. The Hebrew prophets prophesied to Jerusalem. They prophesied to Samaria. They prophesied to the, to the Hebrew people. But almost everything they prophesied had a wider, a much wider application and a much wider uh, vision. And you see that if you really understand literally what's being said in the Old Testament. That's why we take the Old Testament literally... Word for word, stones, bones, history, time, people, places, things, kings, kingdoms. We study it historically and we learn it and we see the historical fulfillments. But then if we have eyes to see, we can see much greater and wider fulfillment in so much of these things. And that's one of the things I hope to point out here in a minute or two as we, as we go through this passage. What the Lord is doing here, He's promising absolute destruction upon the ancient Philistines. And they occupied what would be the, the south and the west of where, the, uh, where Jerusalem is. The one city that's not mentioned is Gath. That's where Goliath was from. And Gath had been utterly destroyed much earlier. They took it out on the, on the, on the uh, uh, Goliath of Gath and his brothers. And you can read the story. But the other four cities are mentioned. And they're on the west side the five cities of the Philistine. And then we'll come to land of Canaan. Oh, Canaan land of Philistines. The Canaan land is the, is the land in the middle. That's the promised land. And the, the land that is to the east of that is Moab and Ammon, mentioned later in this chapter. I'm giving you kind of some geography here. Then what is north of there, across the top of the Fertile Crescent, what is north of Jerusalem and, and Judah is uh, the land of Assyria with the capital city of Nineveh. And eventually it was subsumed into the Babylonian Empire. And then what's to the south is Egypt or Cush, Put and Cush, which is a reference to Egypt, Ethiopia, Somalia, Sudan, in that area, in that kingdom there. So what you have here is a prophecy to the four winds, to the west, to the east, to the north, and to the south. In other words, what God is doing here, He's prophesying that what will happen to the whole world, to all the nations. And this is, uh, this is exactly what you see. Woe to you inhabitants of the seacoast, you nation of the 
Cherethites, and, that, and they're not sure exactly who they are, but they either were a brother nation or it's another word for the Philistine people. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, land of Philistines. I will destroy you until no inhabitant is left, and you, O seacoast, shall be pastures with meadows for shepherds and folds for flock. The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah on which they shall graze in the house of Ascalon. They shall lie down at evening for the Lord will be mindful of them and restore their fortunes. What in the world is that talking about? <laughs> I'm serious. Let me tell you what that's talking about. The land that is described here, the land that's described here is, is, is the ancient land of Philistia. It is the neighbors to Israel to their west. It's a region of the country that is talked about. Then included in it, when he goes to Canaan, is a look to the land of Canaan itself. And when he talks about the seacoast, he's now talking about the, the, the countries that are north of that and are on the ocean. Now, those of you that know your Bible geography, or if you've got a Bible, you flip around and look at a map in the back, you can see when you go up the coastline, you're looking at places like Caesarea, Tyre, Sidon, and, and up the coastline. So what's been described is that whole, uh, I remember in Schofield Bible Church when I was about in the third grade, we, we had to make a little relief map of, of uh, Palestine. And I remember going through there, you know, we had a little salt maps, you know, a little clay and salt. And we had to make the mountains and all, you know, Mount Tabor and Mount uh, Nebo and all of them. And then we had to cut the Jordan River Valley. And it was a lot of fun. I never was good at crafts. Mine looked sloppy and terrible. But, but I learned a little bit about the geography of Palestine. Some of you have actually been there. You've been to some of those parts of Israel. What's being described is that entire environs of Canaan. Now, what's so insignificant about that? Do you remember the Lord when he told his disciples to go into all the world and preach the gospel? And he told him, he said, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That's the center of God's heart and place. In Judea, that's the southern kingdom. That's Judah. In Samaria, that's what's left of the northern kingdom of Israel. And to where else? The uttermost parts of the earth. So that's what's being pictured here is the, is the realm of the uttermost parts of the earth. God has given some prophecy about something that's going to happen in these regions that are neighboring to God's ancient people in Canaan land. And that is a picture of this activity that's going to take place. Now, how does he, he's talking about destroying and utterly casting out and driving them out and uprooting them and all of this stuff. And then it says, I will destroy you until no inhabitants is left. And you, O seacoat, shall be pastures with meadows for shepherds and foals for flocks. The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah on which they graze. And in the houses of Ascalon, that's in Philistia, they shall lie down at evening for the Lord their God will be mindful of them and restore their fortunes. That's a prophecy of the New Testament church because that is precisely where all the first churches were when the disciples left Jerusalem and left Judea and left Samaria and began to move to the uttermost parts of the earth. You remember he, uh, Philip went down to Gaza and found the Ethiopian down there and gave him the gospel. You remember Peter, in, we're talking about Acts chapters 8 and 9. Peter took the gospel into Samaria and then he began to move up the seacoast. Remember he had the vision, he went to Joppa and kept going up the seacoast and, and that's where the centurion was. Read Acts, the early books of Acts, you see that these neighboring regions, these ancient enemies of Israel are now being conquered by the gospel. In fact, when you get up there to the top of the towns of the seacoast, you come to a town that is very insignificant in the Old Testament, but it becomes the capital of that entire region and it's called Antioch. And the believers were first called Christians at Antioch. And it was at Antioch that Barnabas came and Paul joined him. He found 
Paul over in Cilicia and brought him back. And they stayed there for, for several years teaching the people. It was to Antioch that came large number of people from Egypt moved in up there, a lot of Greek speaking. That's why we've got deacons today is because the Greek speaking Jews from the uttermost part of the earth began to move into these congregations, these early churches, and they had to work some things out between the Greek speakers and the Hebrew speakers. The people who were literally the descendants of Abraham, the Jews, and those who were Gentiles, descendants of Japheth and Ham. Canaan is Ham here. So what's being described here, it, it, it's certainly, we're going to turn these thriving cities into rural areas, but it's, it's description of the spread of the church. What is a better description of the church than, than people with shepherds and foals for the flocks? The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah. Pop quiz. Who... Today is the remnant of the house of Judah. That's right. Y'all go to the front. Oh, y'all already on the front. I was going to put you on the front row. The church. That's who we are. We're the true Israel of God. We have trusted Israel's Messiah. We have come in terms of Israel's gospel. We're keeping Israel's law. We are the true descendants of Israel, we talked about that last summer. For four lessons, we talked about Abraham and who is Abraham's seed. And the Bible says he didn't say seeds, plural, as all those different nations coming from Ishmael and coming from Katara and all those other descendants, Esau and all of them, but seed, thy seed, who is Christ, Galatians 3.16. And then it says in, in verse 29 of Galatians 3, if ye be Christ's, if you belong to him, you belong to him by faith, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Go to the book of Romans. What did it say about Abraham? It said he was going to inherit that little tiny land of Canaan. Yeah, but only in a temporary physical literal sense for a period of time to teach a few lessons. But Abraham was looking for the earth, the world. Abraham in, in uh, Romans 4 is to inherit the world. And so that's what, that's what we have here. We have just a little glimpse, just a little type, just a little shadow. The Old Testament doesn't put things in glaring terms with a spotlight and a siren going, but it gives us pictures of things that have. You say, Ron, that don't make any sense to me. I don't believe a word of that. Well, I'm going to ask you. I'm not going to stay there long, I hope, but go to, go to Ezekiel. Ezekiel prophet's going to come, across, come along quite a bit later than Zephaniah. But he's going to start talking about these things. And one of the things he has is a problem with the shepherds. The shepherds are mentioned here, the foals, the flock, that God has a problem with the shepherds. And he says that the shepherds have not done the things that they were supposed to do. My sheep are scattered. They've wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill, my sheep are scattered over the face of the earth. My sheep have become a prey. He says, hear the word of the Lord, shepherds. He's talking to pastors here. I'm in 34. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to know somebody cares. <laughs> he says, Be, this is what the Lord says, behold, I am against the shepherds. I will require my sheep at requite my sheep at their hand and put a stop to them feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. This is a corrupt ministry that's basically gotten into it for the money and they're feathering their own nest and, and plushing up their own bank accounts in their own homes. That's who this is. What verse are you? I'm, uh, I don't know. I can't read those two. <laughs> verse 9, 34, 9. Read the whole thing. <laughs> The word of the Lord says, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds. Prophesy and say to them, even to the shepherds, thus saith the Lord, O shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding themselves, should you not feed the sheep? They eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones. The weak you've not strengthened. The sick you've not healed. The injured you've not bound up. The stray you've not brought back. The lost you have not sought. And with force and harshness you have ruled over them. They're scattered. And the Lord says then in the prophecy, he says, I will rescue my sheep. 
verse 10. And then verse 11, for thus said the Lord, I myself will search for my sheep and will seek them out as the shepherd seeks them out. I will seek my sheep. I will rescue them. I will bring them back from among the peoples and gather them from the nations. I will feed them. I will feed them. Verse 15, I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord. I will seek the lost. I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured. I will strengthen the weak. I will feed them in justice. My flock, verse 20, therefore thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will judge between fat sheep and lean sheep. Because you push with side and shoulder and thrust at all the weak with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. And then finally, this path, I will rescue my sheep. They shall no longer be a prey and I will judge between sheep and sheep. I will set up over them one shepherd, my servant David, and he shall feed them. Who's that? It's Christ. Well, he told us, didn't he? I am the good shepherd. Where would they have known about any description of a good shepherd except in the prophecies of Ezekiel? And so he said, the servant David, he shall feed them. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their, their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. And he goes on and he, he talks about how he'll make a covenant and all the stuff. I don't have time to, to teach Ezekiel. We've already done that, by the way. We did Ezekiel about 12 years ago in this Bible study. <clears throat> you are my sheep. Human sheep of my pasture, I am your God, declares the Lord. That's a prophecy of Christ coming, being the good shepherd, gathering his sheep, his sheep hearing his voice, his sheep knowing them, his sheep following him, and then the assignments of the under shepherds that he has. And so this is, this is the Lord's flock. So let me read that again with that in mind. The seacoast shall become the possession of the remnant of the house of Judah, on which they shall graze in the houses of Ashkelon, and they shall be, they shall lie down at evening, for the Lord their God will be mindful of them and will restore their fortunes. That word appears over and over in the Old Testament prophets. I will restore your fortunes. What fortunes are restored? Well, the fortunes that are restored are the fortunes that God promised Abraham that had been lost in the shuffle of all of Israel's carrying zone all through the centuries before Christ. And the real fortunes of the people of God are outlined by Paul in the book of Ephesians. They're called spiritual blessings. And it's everything from redemption, salvation, adoption, justification, sanctification, glorification, home in heaven, joy in this life, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Just go through all the benefits and the blessings of being a believer in Jesus Christ and being one of his sheep and you have the, the restoring of the fortunes. Well, I got to move on. So we'll pick up here in verse uh, 8. I have heard the taunts of Moab and the revilings of the Ammonites, how they have taunted my people and made boast against their territory. Therefore, as I live, declares the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Moab shall become like Sodom and the Amorites like Gomorrah, a land possessed by, by nettles and salt pits and waste forever. The remnant of my people shall plunder them. The survivors of my nation shall possess them. They shall be their lot in return for their pride because they taunted and boasted against the people of the Lord of hosts. The Lord will be awesome against them. He will famish all the gods of the earth and to him shall bow down. Remember in the very first verse, God's calling on his people to go low, to stoop, to bow down. And they're an obstinate people. They don't do it. So later on, we see how God's going to operate in history and operate in salvation in such a way that not only will Israel bow down, but all of these other nations, the uttermost parts of the earth, the Gentiles from all around the earth will, will bow down to the Lord. It says, each in his place, all the lands of the nations. That's the whole worldwide church. That is Matthew 28, 18. That's all the nations of the earth that is mentioned there. It says, uh, the Lord will be awesome against them for he will famish all the gods of the earth and to him they shall bow down each in his place. Uh, what kind of bowing down is going to take place? Well, let's just go back to Isaiah. Isaiah prophesied before Zephaniah a generation before. 
Turn to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. By myself I have sworn from my mouth has gone out righteousness, a word that shall not return. What's that talking about? That's gospel. From my mouth goes out righteousness, a word that shall not return. To me, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall swear allegiance. Reference, please. Uh, really? <laughs> 40, Isaiah 45, 22 and 23. If you want a real reference, take Philippians, whatever it is, yeah. three. Yeah, that's where Paul quotes that in coming to Christ is everyone bowing down. And so that's, uh, that's what's going on here. I'm going to keep my finger in here because I'm coming back to that Isaiah 46. I saw something on the other side of the page I got to mention. <clears throat> but let's get back to these, uh, the uh, Moab and the Ammonites here. A land possessed by this sea. The remnant of the people shall... Did I get through with that? Yeah. I got all the way to 12? Wow, I'm reading faster than I think. That's great. But stop, stop. We got it. We got to be historical for a minute. We can't get too... Fanciful and spiritual with the Old Testament text. We've got to keep it grounded in history. Who are the Moabites and the Ammonites? Does anybody remember? Sons of Lot. Sons of Lot. And by what circumstance? Oh, yeah. Yeah, let me, yeah, incest. That's the bottom line. Tell the story. Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom there on the, on the plains of the southern part of the land, not far from the Dead Sea. And he picked the best pastures and moved in that direction as he separated himself from his uncle Abraham back in the Genesis story. And when he does that, he gets into that horrible, horrible culture, that, that violent, sexually perverse culture of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you know the story there, the visitors came, and I won't detail the story, I think you know it pretty well. But the Lord told him to get out and reluctantly... He got out. In fact, what happened was the visitor seized him and hauled him out of there. And he gets out of there with no one but his wife and two daughters. And his wife looks back and turns into the pillar of salt. And, and what it amounted to was that whole region is a salt region. It's the salt sea. There, there's a whole mountain of salt in that area. In fact, when we were doing the Sermon on the Mount a few Sundays ago, we talked about the salt of the earth. And we talked about that particular uh, uh, significance of that piece of geography in terms of salt. But his two daughters who became afraid that they would not have a lineage that they needed committed incest with Lot. They got Lot drunk and one after another went into him and conceived and one daughter conceived Moab, named him Moab, and another one uh, Ammon. And Ammon and Moab now are are half brothers, their their father is their grandfather, and that that's enough of that. I, I, <laughs> but what happened to to uh, Moab and Ammon is they became fiercely wicked. They got off to a bad start. I mean, they got a bad got off to a real bad start. It's generational sin. That's right. If I was preaching on the family and generational sin today, we would point out how ridiculous it gets. So in, in very similar thing, remember with Noah? Noah got drunk and some stuff happened with his sons, you know, and, and uh, so forth. We don't have time to get off on that, but, but all kinds of perversity. By the way, our culture is right there. Don't sit around and look at me like we're a bunch of Puritans. I wish we were, but the Puritans have been taking a bad rap now for about... 150 years. We've been laughing at the Puritans, haven't we? Been laughing at the Puritans, how uptight they were and how rigid and how much they were just, you know, didn't have any fun. And, you know, that thing, you know, that being a Puritan is afraid somebody somewhere is having a good time. <laughs> no, the Puritans were just godly men and women that wanted to live right before the Lord and to keep His commandments. And so, and because they did that, because they did do what God said in terms of family law and structure, God gave them a blessing. You know what that blessing is? United States of America. No other country was founded on a Puritan ethic, a work ethic, a family ethic, a sexual ethic, an educational ethic. You go down the list of everything that came from the Puritan culture that was somehow planted in America. Not perfectly and not universally and not absolutely, but it was planted in America and there's been 200 years 300 years, really, if you count the colonial days, of Puritan blessing upon America. 
Which heritage, by the way, I will announce to you, we have squandered. It's gone. Our, our fathers and mothers from the Mayflower might have received multiple generation blessing, but we're not going to. We're already seeing first generation curses in our own families. I see it in my own family. And sin is just a horrible thing. That's why I hate it so much. That's why I preach against it so much. And that's why I want us to look to the one person that can save us from our sins. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That's, that's gospel message. Well, who are the Ammonites and the, and the Moabites? Well, they do what, exactly what it says. They have taunted my people. If you want to study about that, that's what the Moabites did to God's people when they were crossing in the land toward the latter uh, chapters. You read about it in the book of Numbers. You can read about the ministry. You remember Balaam the prophet who got spoken to by, by a, his donkey? By the way, we did a series on that a few years ago in this summer Bible study. The ministry of Balaam the prophet. And, and that particular incident there was the Moabites who were, who were harassing God's people and drawing them into sin. The, the, the main thing they did was they, they put, they couldn't, Balaam couldn't curse them, but he said, I can tell you what will get them. And that's bring in those beautiful young Moabite women and let those Israeli boys get a good look at them. And they'll marry them. And when they marry them, they'll, they'll worship their mother's God. And that'll be the end. And that's exactly what it is. And you may have how the Lord redeemed that. Roll forward quite a few generations and you'll find a little beautiful young Moabite girl, Ruth, that the Lord brings into the covenant. And she says, my people, your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. And God redeems Moab. Nobody, no matter how horrible a sinner they are, is outside the grace and mercy of God. God reaches down. He gets the very worst. He, he redeems but that's, that's another part of the Old Testament. So that's what the Moabites did. The Ammonites, it says, they made boast against their territory. The Ammonites were the ones that settled closer to the Transjordan area. Remember, there were 12 tribes of Israel and, and, three, and two and a half or three and a half of them were on the other side of the Jordan. The Transjordan tribes, half the tribe of Manasseh was over there. Well, the group, the, the territory that was right below them were the Ammonites. In fact, that's the modern state of Jordan. Ammon, Jordan, that's the Ammonites, one of the most ancient cities in the world. And the Ammonites were always fighting territorial wars with the, with the Transjordan tribes. And because of that, the Lord here says, Therefore, as I live, Moab shall become like Sodom, and the Ammonites like Gomorrah. So God's going to destroy them. He's going to judge them. That's what God does to sinners. But then he says, the remnant of my people shall plunder them and the survivors of my nation shall possess them. You know, one of the strongest strongholds of early Christianity was anywhere in the ancient world? At Jordan. Go look at all the Christian church ruins there are. The city of Petra became a, a, a fortress for the people of, of God's people, especially during those early 200 years of history after the coming of Christ. That's how the Lord conquers people. You know, you know how the Lord conquers His enemies? He turns them into His friends. He conquers them with grace and mercy and brings them lovingly to Himself. And the obstinate and the rebellious and those people that won't have any of it, they won't bow before the Lord, they won't yield to the Lord, they won't call upon the name of the Lord, they won't worship the Lord their God with all their hearts, they won't call upon Him for salvation. Eventually they're destroyed. If you think I believe in hell, you're right. And hell's a good thing. I'm glad for hell. One of these days, finally, every solid person that has spent his life rebuking the Lord God Almighty, cussing his name, denying his son, and, and giving Christians person, chopping off Christians' heads, and thousands and thousands of years of persecuting the one true God and all of his saints, they're going to get what they deserve. Amen. And God's going to strike a blow against them. And he'll do it according to his justice and mercy. The judge of all the earth will do the right. Heinous sinners will get severe punishment. Let the Lord sort all that out. I'm not going to try to tell you all the things the Bible doesn't tell us about that stuff. But I know one thing that he's coming on a, on a, on a conquering steed and he's got his sword on his thigh. And he's coming to conquer. 
Here's where the Apostle Paul says it in real kind New Testament terms. The Lord will come in flaming fire, taking vengeance upon those that know not the gospel. <laughs> That's the judgment. Hadn't backed off a little bit. So here's what he's going to do. He's going he's to uh, uh, destroy, be awesome against them. It's, it, and to those that will bow down each in his place, all the lands of the nations. Now we have the last part of the book here. We got about five or six minutes to finish. Verse 12, let me read this. O you Cushites. By the way, I've already told you this. Where does Cush come from? What son of Noah? Ham. What is Cush, the region that describes the modern countries? Egypt, Ethiopia, Egypt. Somalia, Sudan, that, that's the south. And, and then he's going to mention them and give them short shrift here. Doesn't in other prophecies, but does it here. Just mentions one, one, one uh, uh, half of a stanza. And then he's going to mention the north. And he will stretch out his hand against the north. And who's in the north? Assyria, Nineveh, the cities that were founded by Nimrod. And we looked at that at the Genesis series too, didn't we? We saw who Nimrod was in the ancient world. He was the founder of Babylon, the Tower of Babel and all of that, and the great city of Nineveh. Now, here's these horrible prophecies against Nineveh. It says, I will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry waste like a, a desert. Herds shall lie down in her midst, kinds of bee, all kinds of beasts. And the owl and the hedgehog shall lodge in her capitals, a voice and I'll stop right there in reading. That, that's, that's the judgment upon Cush in the first part of the verse. You also, Cushites, shall be slain by my sword. Notice this. Now the Lord speaking in the first person through the prophet. And he does it again. Uh, he says, he will stretch out his hand against the north. The Lord says, I'll do the destruction. And then the prophet turns around and says, the Lord will do the destruction. The Lord, they, the prophet's telling us uh, what, the, what the, the, uh, the consequences are. So now we're in the, looked at the south very briefly. We'll just leave it alone and we'll go to the north. He shall stretch out his hand against the north. If you want to know anything about Nineveh and about Assyria, you've got two prophets you've got to study. You've got to study Jonah. Remember Jonah? Jonah, it was commissioned to go to what city? Nineveh, the capital of Assyria, the north. And this was very early. This was uh, much uh, be, uh, to before the days of Zephaniah. And you know the story of Jonah, we won't repeat it, but what did the people in Nineveh do when they heard the message of doom? You know, you know what, yet, how many days was it? 30 days? Six? They repented. They repented. Yeah. yeah. He, he gave them in a few days that the Lord's going to destroy them. And they repented. And guess what the Lord did when they repented? He spared them. And he made Jonah mad. Because he hated the Assyrians. And he had prophesied, he was, in, he was enjoying prophesying prophecy of doom against, against Assyria. It just made his day to stand up and preach that message. And then he realized the Lord is merciful beyond all imagination. That great and wicked city of Nineveh, descendant of Nimrod, who was the original idolater and God hater in, in the days after the flood. And God spared Nineveh. So you've got to study Nineveh. And even then you also need to study the prophecies of Nahum. Habakkuk prophesied about how there was going to be a destruction of, in, of, of Babylonian, Babylonian captivity. Behold, I raise up the Chaldeans, that fierce people, is what the Lord told Habakkuk. But the other one is Nahum. Nahum is a short prophecy about the destruction of Assyria. And basically they fell for one reason. Not like Sodom and Gomorrah for perversity, but they fell for pride. Pride. Those of us that are not perverts are proud. <laughs> this is how we pray. Lord, I thank you. It's a prayer of thanksgiving. I thank you that I'm not as this man, this publican. For I am good. I am a deacon. I tithe. I come to Bible study in the hot part of the summer. I just, you know, there's any, the Lord hates the pride. Pride is an abomination to God. So if you want a real good study of how God thinks about the prideful, 
and you studied Nahum. And that's what was always said about Nineveh. It was, it was, the, great, it was the great city. And uh, here he talks about it, it in term of its desolation. It's waste like a desert. There's wild animals and all kinds of beasts. There's owl. There's a hedgehog. Uh, there's all these, these uh, crazy things that are out in the countryside, which is an interesting picture because Nineveh was always, even on up all through ancient history, a huge, beautiful city. And its, its uh, sister city down the river, Babylon, was one of the great wonders of the world. And yet their, their destruction is described in terms of a wilderness, a howling wilderness. The howling wilderness, the desolation, the place where the, the beasts are wild and there's snakes and there's, 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 there's all that. That is a picture of the wilderness is a picture of the backside of God's pleasure. It's a picture of the curse. That's where the thorn is and the briars and all that. We'll see that a little later in this prophecy. Not today, but... but it's the, it, it's the howling wilderness. It's the place of God's curse. So God's going to put that upon them. And then there's a picture of a beautiful home. It's got a beautiful picture window, an ornate, gorgeous window that looks out over the beautiful river and up along the, the, the scenic beauty of the hanging gardens and all the rest. And in that window is the glass is all broken out and there's a hoot owl. That's pretty disgusting to think about. A voice shall hoot in the window. Devastation will be on the threshold. Front door will be just ragged and torn down and look like a thousand robbers have come through there and a hundred homeless have slept there for a week. It'll be a desolate and her cedar work will be laid bare. You don't think God can take a beautiful city and turn it into a wasteland because of people's perversity? Have you ever, hast thou considered San Francisco? Hast thou considered Austin, Texas? That's what happens when people are far from God. They fall into this ruin this is the exalted city. This is the one that's, that's puffed up. This is the city of Nahum. This is the city. They live securely. And here's their sin right here. They said in their heart, here's the heart of their pride, I am and there is no one else. That, that's the, the extent of their pride. In other words, they become their own God. They don't need the true God. They have become God in their own Collective. Instead of elevating God Almighty, the one and true God, they have elevated corporate man, collective man, communist man, to be the tyrant, the ruler, the one who brings all the blessings, all the equity and the welfare state, the one who does all the saving saves them from poverty and from want and all of that. This is, this is the exaltation of the human being pridefully above the Lord. What a desolation she has become, a lair for wild beasts. Everyone who passes her by hisses and shakes his fist. In other words, it's disgusting. It's derision. And one more passage, and I'll, I'll just... Uh, and I'm going back to the Isaiah passage. And uh, we'll see, see what we can see there. Well, I don't know yet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. My paper clip came out, so I lost my place. My life is put together by paper clips. <laughs> Listen to me, O house of Judah, all the remnant of the house of Israel, 46. You who have borne by me from before your birth, I carried you from the womb, even to your old age. I am he, or I am. That's the Lord claiming that the great I am saying, and to gray hairs I will carry you. I have made and I will bear. I will carry and will save. To whom will you liken me and make me equal or compare me that we may be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out the silver in the scales, hire a goldsmith and he makes it into a God and they fall down in worship. 
lift it to their shoulders. They carry it. They set it in its place and it stands there. It cannot move from this place. No one cries to it. It does not answer or save him from his trouble. This is the absolute um, uh, epitome of idol making and, Id and idolatry. But I am the Lord and there is no other. I am God and there is none beside me declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. By the way, that's the assurance of our salvation. God's going to do what he says he's going to do. If he's begun a good work in you, he'll see it through till the day of redemption. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my counsel from far, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purposed and I will do it. Listen to me, you stubborn of heart. You who are far from righteousness, bring, I bring near my righteousness. It is not far off and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Who's been talked about there in that, in that uh, last verse, verse 13 of 46 Isaiah? I will bring near my righteousness. Who is the righteousness of God? It's in Christ, isn't it? Bring near. What does the word Emmanuel mean? God near us. God with us. This is gospel. That's why Paul preached the gospel. You know, did you know Paul didn't have the book of Romans until he wrote it? <laughs> but he preached the gospel. What, what book did he use? He didn't have Philippians. He didn't have anything. He didn't even have the gospel of Matthew, probably. He might have had the gospel of Luke at some point. <clears throat> He preached the gospel out of Deuteronomy, Psalms, Isaiah, because it's clear as it can be. Listen to that verse one more time and then we're done. This is the Lord promising us our salvation. I will bring my righteousness. It is not far off. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth. If you will confess and my salvation will not delay, I will put my salvation in Zion. Who is Zion? It's the city of God. It's the people of God. It's the new Jerusalem. In the book of Revelation, it is adorned like a bride and descends out of heaven. It's the bride of Christ. It's the church. And the Lord says, I will put my salvation in say, Where is salvation? It's in Christ, the righteousness of God. It's in the church. It's where God dwells with his people. Keeping that promise. I'll dwell in your midst. And that's what he's going to say in chapter 3. If you stay with me another week or so, we'll have this thing covered. In chapter 3, he's going to talk about how the Lord thy God is in the midst of thee. He will joy over thee and rejoice over thee. And we're going to talk about what it means to be a happy, praising the Lord Christian. And that's that last phrase. For Israel, I will put salvation in Zion. For Israel, my glory. The reason we have wonderful salvation is it's God's idea. God is saving the people, not just to save us. That's, that's a wonderful thing, and that is certainly being accomplished. But he's doing it for his glory. Amen. That in all things, God might receive all the glory. We have our solas, you know, sola fide, soli faith, you know, sola scriptura. You, you know our solas? Do you ever know we have one that is sola gratia, soli grace? And then solely for the, Lord, the, the glory of the Lord. The glory of the Lord. 